Site reliability engineering was invented at Google to improve the reliability of their systems in production. And it works. It works extremely well. You can argue that SRE is one of those things that has helped Google to be by far the preferred way to find things on the internet. Yes, PageRank mattered too, but the ability to quickly, reliably and efficiently deliver great, fast, efficient search and many, many other services at unprecedented scale is one of the reasons that Google performed 92% of internet searches between 2009 and 2020. For me, lots of descriptions of SRE focus on the wrong things. I think that SRE is much more important than site reliability engineers, for example, or even only ops and infrastructure. I think that SRE fills an important gap in software development by closing a vital feedback loop that is what happens to our software in production. It also provides a fantastic tool that allows us to better address that perennial problem, how do we prioritise work on technical debt? So for today's episode, let's take a look at SRE and how it fits into our overall development approach. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Equal Experts, Octopus, and Specflow. They're supporters of our channel and have been helping us for a long time, so please do help them in turn by checking out their links in the description below. My book, Modern Software Engineering, is currently a bestseller on Amazon, and it describes 10 ideas that together represent an engineering approach to software development. My definition of engineering in a software context is the application of an empirical, scientific approach to finding efficient solutions to practical problems. I also think that anything that aspires to qualify as engineering for software must help us to deliver better software faster. If it doesn't do that, or adds unnecessary bureaucracy or complexity, it's clearly wrong. And it doesn't count as something that we can honestly call engineering. My book has been widely reviewed as giving people some new ways to think about some of these problems. So if this sounds interesting, why not take a look? There's a link to that in the description below too. One of the ideas that is core to how I think about working on software is to work experimentally. Try things out, control the variables, be willing to make mistakes. I think that this is one of the foundational approaches that differentiates what I think of as software engineering from more regular software development. In fact, working experimentally is one of my 10 foundational principles that I think define what software engineering really means. Working experimentally doesn't mean Six Sigma precision on everything. It means having a theory that we intend to test and working to control the variables sufficiently so that we can understand the results when we see them. Recently, I was asked by a friend to write a foreword to his new book on site reliability engineering. It's called Establishing SRE Foundations by Vlad Yukis and is currently on pre-release now on Amazon. Due for release on September the 1st, I think, you should look out for it. It's a really good book. One of the things that Vlad's book reminded me of was how good an experimental approach SRE really is. If you're not familiar with SRE, it's the DevOps style of engineering approach that in was invented at Google. The concept of SRE was created by Ben Trainer Sloss around 2003. So it started around the same time as continuous delivery and a little before DevOps. This is interesting because all three are looking at solving very similar problems and adopting a very similar techniques, but addressing the problem from slightly different angles even though they all focus on the importance of optimizing the whole process and using software to do that. At the heart of SRE is the idea of a deep collaboration between product, development and operations. SRE aims to break barriers between these groups and firmly, clearly align their goals. 
This is important because typically most organizations that don't work this way fail to do that and so incur big costs of coordination and friction between the different groups of people involved in creating and operating software. Product focused people want lots of features and if left to themselves will tend to ignore or at least miss the importance of sustainability and the costs of low quality in production. The temptation for developers is to respond to schedule pressure to produce more features by cutting corners and so they buy into a vicious cycle of ever reducing quality and ever reducing productivity as a result. Short term optimizations can kill software development progress completely. Some of my clients when I started working with them had not been able to release any software at all for several years. Ops people faced with a deluge of low quality software, destabilizing their precious production systems, build processes that are intentionally designed to make it more difficult to release changes in the hope of limiting the flow of rubbish into production. None of this is in anyone's interest. Continuous delivery thinking started in the teams that I worked on want by want us wanting to be able to take advantage of the increased capacity to create what we thought of as good software based on our growing and more confident use of techniques like continuous integration and test driven development. We wanted to release our changes into production more often and thought that we were ready to do it. To do that, we needed to gain the trust of operations people to understand what it was that we were doing and to work with us on different ways of doing things. DevOps began with operations people wanting to take advantage of the more agile ways of working that they were seeing development teams benefit from. SRE though started by what Ben Trainer Sloss described as SRE is what happens when you ask a software engineer to design an operations team. Which is pretty similar actually to what it was that we were doing with continuous delivery. SRE starts by doing what I nearly always recommend for most things, focus on the outcomes. The mechanisms are means to an end. They don't matter as much as the results. I think that this is a slightly different take on SRE, at least compared to how most commentators describe it. Wikipedia defines SRE like this. SRE is a set of principles and practices that incorporates aspects of software engineering and applies them to infrastructure and operations problems. While I think that this is a reasonable statement of how most people see SRE and is definitely where it came from, I think, this, is a defini this definition is too limiting. It misses something much more important to my mind. The focus on infras and ops is one example of a much more useful, much more valuable model for organising our work. And this broader focus is only a tiny step from what SRE asks of us. If we treat each change to production as an experiment of some kind and aim to identify useful measures that will give us feedback on each experiment and clearly define our expectations, what values are for these measures we expect to achieve, then this is exactly how SRE says we should organise things. But the measures for our experiment don't need to be constrained only to infrastructure and ops measures. They could also tell us about the value that our ideas deliver or how much our users like them or not. For software development in general, but particularly software at massive scale like Google, service provision is important, of course. The ability of the system to provide useful service to customers and users is what really matters in the end. It doesn't matter how great your algorithms, tools or designs are if you can't deliver working useful software to users. SRE focuses everyone on that and that's a very good thing. This isn't necessarily a simple problem to solve though. It's very common for teams and organisations to set themselves unrealistic goals. We want 24 by 7 by 365 uptime. Okay. Well, 100% is somewhat unrealistic and even approximating that is extremely expensive to achieve. So do you really want to do that for everything? It probably means that you're going to make progress very slowly indeed and spend lots of money while doing so. 
The work to make things robust and resilient is complicated. This is one of the important ways that SRE helps us. It surfaces these trade-offs between the reliability of our system and the value that it delivers. As I said, it doesn't matter how good your product idea. If the software doesn't work in production when your users need it, it's useless. This doesn't mean 100% uptime for everything. But it does mean thinking carefully about what reliability means in the context of every change. We need to agree on some measurements that we can use to determine that reliability. This introduces some key ideas in SRE. The idea is that as part of specifying a piece of work, representatives of product, development and operations get together and agree how to measure success. They identify service level indicators, SLIs, something that we can measure that tells us if the idea is working or not. Next, they'll identify service level objectives. What score on the SLI scale are we aiming to achieve? The idea here is to recognise that there is a trade-off. Sure, you can say 100% uptime, but as well as being practically unrealistic, this also means that new features are now priority number two. Is that really what you intend? Maybe that's the right call for some things, and it's certainly dumb for others. I probably want to support people placing orders all the time, but do I really need the same level of service for looking at ancient order history? The point here is to agree up front what the trade-off really ought to be. Let's look at a simple example. Imagine a service that authenticates users on, on their way into your system. Assuming that we'd like people to be able to use our system then, uptime for a service like this is pretty important because when it's down, users can't do anything useful at all. So we could sensibly choose service availability as an important measure of success for a service like this. So availability is our service level indicator. 100% availability means the service is always ready for use all of the time. So that's what's a reasonable expectation for availability for our authentication service. Maybe 9.99% of the time is good, an acceptable target perhaps. That is, the service is ready for use 99.99% of the time. This is our service level objective. The other idea that you may have heard about in the context of SRE is the idea of an error budget. The error budget is how much room you have to play with. Google defines it as the amount of error that your service can accumulate over a certain period of time before your users start being unhappy. Or many er how many errors are you willing to tolerate as being within the normal bounds of operation? By defining the scale that we will use to measure the service level indicator and our expectations for a reasonable score on that scale, our service level objective, we have implicitly also in some sense defined our error budget. In this case, in this example, we are allowed 0.01% downtime. This translates to around about 52 minutes per year being acceptable or one minute per week. So maybe a sensible error budget is a bit less than 14 minutes per quarter. We can use this as a tool to plan all sorts of things. For argument's sake, let's say when we update our service, there's a one minute of downtime. Then that places a hard limit to how many times we can afford to deploy changes. If we deploy once per week, there's no error budget left over to cope with mistakes or hardware failures. We can also use our error budget to track our performance in production and so prioritize our work. If we have an outage of some kind that takes 26 minutes to recover from, we have used half of our annual error budget in that single event. That means that we have to slow our rate of release even further or more likely invest in work that makes the changeover a lot more efficient, reduce the amount of downtime during release. 
The great thing that SRE does is to establish all of this as a kind of rational contract between all of the players. Product people know this is essential because they agreed to the service level objective and because it was focused on what users will count as success. They clearly understand the implications of missing the target. Developers are free without the need to coordinate decision making with anybody else to work on speeding up the deployment because they've already agreed to the priorities based on the service level objectives. Ops people can decide to release less frequently to manage the error budget until the developers have sped up the release, again without the need to ask permission because everybody's already agreed on the objectives. This is a very good thing and fixes a very common and very important problem. It aligns the goals that everybody is working towards and aligns their thinking, all through structuring their agreements in the form of service level objectives. Here we have a tool that helps everyone to agree on priorities that matter to users. This means that we can much more easily prioritise difficult things like fixing technical debt in our deployment of our software. If we see our error budget diminish because of the debt, we must fix it to achieve the SLO. Quite a lot of descriptions of SRE focus for me on the wrong things. As usual, I'd quibble a bit over the choice of words. Site reliability is clearly pushing our thinking in the direction of op operations and infrastructure. But if we think of reliability more broadly, does our change correctly and reliably deliver the value that we intended? Then I think it delivers much more than the ops or infrastructure only focus that's most commonly described. I think this is at the root of the real value of SRE and the reason that I would agree that this qualifies as a genuine engineering approach and provides a great structure for closing that important feedback loop from production back into development and product design. This idea is that it treats the release of change as an experiment. It forces us to think about what defines success, the service level objective, and it helps us to think about how we can control the variables by defining the nature of the measurement that we will use to evaluate that success, the service level indicator. I think that one of the reasons that this is important is that we can use this approach for any kind of experiment that makes sense to us. So I think that the name SRE is a little bit misleading in that it tends to limit how people think about this otherwise extremely valuable approach to releasing software. It's not just about technical measures like uptime or resource usage, important as, though, as those might be, but it's also about the impact of our changes in a business context. I think that the concept of SRE is exactly right. It's part of what I mean when I describe the importance of working experimentally. If we take this broader view, then we should treat every change into production as an experiment of some kind. And as part of that experiment, we should decide how we will measure the results and even better, what we will count as failure based on those measures. Focusing on failure may sound a little wrong, particularly if you've no scientific training in your background, but this is an, an idea that is at the heart of modern science. We don't aim to prove things, we aim to disprove things. This is a much stronger stance, and it's at the very foundations of SRE thinking. The SLO defines the limit of some measure. Fall below that limit and your change isn't good enough. It doesn't matter if you think of this as SRE, hypothesis-driven development, or as I would term it, working experimentally. What this is really about is structuring our work to take advantage of humanity's best approach to learning, science. And when we do that in the service of some practical outcome, we call that engineering. In this case, software engineering. Thank you very much for watching.